I guess that's a good welcome. Uh, and our gathering this morning is both timely and untimely. Uh, it is timely in the sense that, uh, as you may have seen in this morning's paper or heard on the uh, news last night, uh, the uh, announcement yesterday by the Environmental Protection Agency of an endangerment finding uh, with reference to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon pollution, as I think we should be calling it, uh, to bring home what this is really about. Uh, a significant development, but also a very untimely one since uh, the EPA has been under court order to do that for some time, and we've done uh, really little or nothing about this issue uh, since George Bush announced as a candidate for president over eight years ago that he thought we should regulate carbon emissions and carbon dioxide, uh, a, a pledge quickly abandoned under Dick Cheney's Secret Energy Task Force meetings, uh, much to the chagrin of his EPA administrator, uh, Christine Todd Whitman. Uh, we are endangered, uh, and we know from the science, I'm sure this is in the uh, Greenpeace uh, report that I was just handed, uh, that in this century we could be headed uh, for a two degree increase, or so said, perhaps even as much as a five degree increase in global temperatures. Uh, some people see that as slight, who don't really uh, fill this gathering with faces this morning, or are not aware of the problem. When you think about it as it applies to you personally, and I think we've got to find ways to bring home this message to people who aren't thinking about climate change or global warming this morning, they got many different priorities like keeping bread on the table and a job, uh, that uh, we bring it home to them on an individual basis. If you think about it, uh, for you individually, uh, a two degree increase in your body temperature is something that usually leaves you feeling a little uneasy and unhappy and not up to your normal uh, level of activity. And a five degree increase in your body temperature uh, may approach the catastrophic uh, and get you off to the hospital. And that's really what's happening to our globe. Uh, huge increases in temperature, the effects of climate change already be, being felt, and I expect your familiarity with those issues is why you're here today. Until uh, very recently, uh, the United States was number one in the world in uh, carbon pollution, and Texas, of course, was number one among all the 50 states. I'm not sure how those numbers get readjusted if Governor Perry is successful in having us secede. But I expect either way that, you know, it's still uh, a very significant contribution to the problem that we face and an imperative that uh, because so much of the problem has emanated from our state that the solution emanate from this area also. And I'm here basically with the message that the only way that we will achieve uh, a genuine and meaningful response uh, to global warming is if we have more energy use, and that energy is your energy, the energy of, of personal involvement in demanding an effective response. Uh, as an early supporter of President Obama, as an enthusiast for having a Democratic majority after having been there in Washington uh, for 12 years with, in the minority, and for 14 years without a majority and a Democratic president, uh, there's much that we've already done and much that can be done, but we will not get an effective solution to global warming or to health care reform unless we have an involved citizenry that won't take no for an answer. And that's really what it's all about. I, can, I have I spent most of last week at a, a conference with several members of the Senate and the House to focus solely on this problem, uh, our focus on the nation, our focus on climate change. Uh, and the obstacles uh, sometimes in the course of discussion seem to be near insurmountable. I know that uh, we will not get the attention that we need in Washington and get any kind of bill passed unless more people feel the sense of urgency about this problem that brought most of you here today, that you recognize we need to act and we need to act yesterday about this problem. In the House of Representatives, and I hope this is not true in the Senate, but I must say I was not encouraged by the senators that I met with last week uh, on this issue, in the House of Representatives, we will get the same number of Republican votes for any bill uh, for a cap-and-trade system, for uh, whether 
whether it's weak or strong, we'll get the same number of votes for that from Republican House members as we received on the economic recovery package, the same number of votes that we received on President Obama's budget, and that's zero. And so we have to build a coalition, a majority, uh, from the Democratic members of the Congress, many of whom were elected in districts uh, that uh, President Obama did not carry in the last election. Indeed, uh, if you look at our state, if you look at my district, uh, I represent eight counties. I'll be heading on down to Smithville shortly after uh, meeting with you this morning. Seven of those eight counties did not support President Obama uh, in the last election. And winning over people concerned about uh, whether this is the, the vote that makes or break their future as a new member of Congress particularly is a real challenge. It's a real challenge particularly if they have many energy intensive industries uh, and many of those industries are feeling a tremendous pinch in high unemployment rates already and it's a real uh, pinch if they have any coal produced in their area which unfortunately is much of the United States. So it's a question of how we build the coalition uh, to overcome the obstacles that are being raised and recognizing that we've got to find those votes within the Democratic Party. Uh, I think that the only division among the House Republicans that I see on either the Budget Committee or the Ways and Means Committee where we've debated these issues is the division between those in kind of the flat earth creationist part of the Republican Party who deny still that climate change is being influenced by human activity. Uh, there really are a number of those people who speak out and those who just want to attack every proposal that we have to do anything about it. Indeed, the top Republican who happens to come from Texas on the Energy and Commerce Committee, I think has, has basically summarized the position of House Republicans to respond to this, uh, and I, I reduce it to three words as their answer to climate change. Look for shade. Uh, he says that we can adapt as humankind has always adapted to changes in climate, and essentially we don't need to do much more. Uh, I think it's important as we continue this discussion uh, to uh, have our response to the excuses for inaction, which are uh, multiple, uh, that we hear in the course of these debates and have as we debated this issue about two weeks ago in the House Budget Committee and as we have had hearings in the Ways and Means Committee over the last uh, uh, two months. The first of these arguments uh, again, summarized, uh, coming in the, in, from the mouth of a Texas Republican from Dallas who serves with me on the Budget Committee, is that anything we do represents, in his words, unilateral economic disarmament. It's sort of a keeping up with the Joneses' argument to the bottom, that if India and China don't do what we do, we ought not to do anything, that it's a job killer. Uh, there is no one who is proposing that what we do should be without regard to what the rest of the world does or who is insensitive to the challenges of competitiveness both for American exporters and for importers. But you know, it, as we're seeing, uh, I guess yesterday again at the uh, uh, Summit of the Americas, it takes a little bit of time for the rest of the world to realize that on climate change, for example, as with some other issues, the United States wants to lead instead of to obstruct, as we've done for the last eight years. Uh, we are the country that the rest of the world has been trying to pull along to lead on this issue. Uh, and now we finally are beginning to lead. And with Copenhagen coming up and the chance for further action in December, leading now and effectively is extremely important. Uh, the, uh, the, there are ways to encourage both carrot and stick countries like China and India to participate uh, that we need to explore. There are ways to assure that American jobs are not lost if people want to come together and find a solution instead of just an excuse uh, on this issue. Uh, I think competitiveness is important, but it's not a reason to, to refuse to act on this issue. Second argument that I hear uh, can be summed up as Yankee ingenuity that uh, we've always found a way to solve problems. And you're gonna, you will hear, I know, later today from some of the exciting things that are happening right here in Central Texas that Jake and others have been a part of. And it is great. There is a tremendous amount of ingenuity going on. Uh, 